What might push a person over the edge and prompt them to kill themselves? Could the weather be a factor? What about depression? What are the drugs that really can help and which ones don't? Well, Dr. Riff El Malik is a professor of psychiatry and director of the Mood Disorders Research Program at the University of Louisville, and he's here to talk about those things. Riff, good to see you again. Good to see you. Thank you very much for having me. It's very much a pleasure to be here. Well, good. I'm glad you think it's a pleasure. <laughs> we'll, we'll see if by the end of this interview it's still a pleasure. How about that? <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk a little bit. You did a... Um, a study where you looked at barometric pressure and suicide. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, uh, it's actually, uh, it was a follow-up study. So um, over a decade ago, we originally looked at a study uh, looking at weather variables in general. And actually, the original purpose of that study was looking at emergency psychiatric visits. And what we found was uh, actually, uh, I'm, I'll give you the interpretation and go back and tell you the data. What we found was that uh, of all the weather variables that we looked at, barometric pressure uh, was statistically associated with what we interpreted to be impulsive behavior. And we defined impulsive behavior as people doing something that ended up resulting them in showing up in a psychiatric emergency room. And the reason we said that was impulsive is because there was actually no association between any of the weather variables and people needing to be in the hospital. But there was association, there was an increase of people coming to the emergency room for something that was generally impulsive, and then being discharged that same day. And so was it low barometric pressure or high barometric pressure? That low barometric okay. pressure. And, so um, so the, the barometric pressure is low, and some of these people had an incident, a psychiatric incident. And it, yeah, and it wasn't, so, so, so our original hypothesis was that it would be an increase in impulsivity. So okay. we went back okay. and got police records for... Uh, uh, person-to-person -person violence, um, assaults. Almost always all assaults are uh, not planned. Uh, people don't plan their fights. People don't plan any of these things. These are generally things that happen spontaneously and, again, mm -hmm. probably rela related to an increase in impulsive behaviors. Uh, and we found, again, that assaults were increased when the pressure was low. Barometric pressure. When the barometric pressure was low. And, and barometric pressure, by the way, just so that people understand, it's just sort of the, the pressure of, if you will, the weight of the atmosphere on top of us. And the barometric pressure changes um, really as, as with weather patterns. Mm -hmm. And the easiest way for a person to know that a barometric pressure is low is to feel wind. If you feel wind, it's usually beca because you're in a low area and an and, and adjoining high pressure area is pushing the air where you're where you're at. So we're getting a meteorology lesson here too. That's great. Man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so so that's the um, uh, that's how you know barometric pressure is going. And if you think about it, you know wind is generally associated with um, bad weather. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, you know, rain and other things like that. Um, so, so we actually at that time, many years ago, uh, looked at suicide uh, because we thought, well, okay, suicide may be impulsive. Is there an association? But we only had one year's worth of data, of suicide data. And it was, uh, it's only Jefferson County data, by the way. Uh, and so there wasn't enough statistical power within that database to show any variation. So, so that was an interesting study. And then over the, the subsequent 10, 11 years, we actually, uh, it was actually 11 years, we collected 11 years worth of data, again, from Jefferson County. And now that we had a much larger sample size, we did the same analysis and found indeed that completed suicides are more likely to occur when the barometric pressure is lower, um, which is, again, suggests that at least some aspect of completed suicide is impulsive. So the, the bottom line is you took this impulsive behavior, what you found was lower barometric pressure, pressure impulsive behavior, folks showing up in emergency rooms. And over the course of those 11 years, you took more data and found, all right, well, those folks are showing up with impulsive behavior, not only are just showing up in emergency rooms, but some of them are committing suicide 
at a higher rate when the I'm putting words in your mouth now uh, higher rate when the barometric pressure is low than when the barometric pressure is high is that fair yeah I, I would put it in How terms of likelihood it? there there the, that that the likelihood increases when the barometric pressure is low there's a couple of um, uh, uh, of things to think about in terms of that. Low barometric pressure, like I said, is also associated with inclement weather. And, and all of our findings may be related to just what people do when the weather is bad. So uh, if the weather is bad, I'm more likely to stay at home instead of go out. And, you know, if um, I'm more likely to fight with my wife and get into a uh, domestic violence thing. Or if the weather is bad, uh, I'm more likely to stay at home and use drugs and do something, something stupid and end up in a psychiatric emergency room. Likewise, if, if the weather is bad, I'm more likely to sit and obsess about how bad my life is. And uh, so, so... It, it may not be just barometric pressure. It may be some of the aspects that are associated with low barometric pressure. Um, it is important, by the way, um, our study was the first to show that barometric pressure is associated with suicide in North America, but it's not the first study to show that barometric pressure and suicide are, are related. There was a large Scandinavian study that didn't have enough completed suicides because they only, again, used one year's worth of data, but had enough suicide attempts to show, again, that lower barometric pressure is associated with increased risk for, at least in those cases, serious uh, suicide attempts. We're talking with Dr. Riff El Malik, who's a professor of psychiatry and the director of the Mood Disorders Research Program at the University of Louisville. I've got several more questions about this. Um, and, and I want to get to an, a ketamine study that uh, you talked about uh, as well. Um, you said that, you know, it could just been lousy weather that mm. makes you, is that a possibility that it's that's, really not low bar barometric pressure, it's just a cloudy day, so that's why I'm bummed out and I'm more likely to commit suicide? Um, not uh, because I'm bummed out, but because of other things. Um, okay. uh, actually, uh, uh, people um, are more likely to actually kill themselves on sunny days, uh, not really? cloudy days. Yeah, so you can have you can have low barometric pressure and still have that's a sunny, sunny day. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so it's not always inclement uh, weather, but um, but that statistical association isn't as great as uh, as um, uh, low barometric pressure. Was this a big deal when you? had this first study uh, linking these two together um, in the United States? Um, no. I mean, it's uh, because we don't have a mechanism. We don't know why this is. Uh, and then this is also a statistical association. It doesn't mean that, you know, I'm feeling bad and the pressure drops. Uh, I'm going to kill myself tomorrow. It, it, it absolutely doesn't tell you that. Uh, it, it's a statistical association. So it's um, it, it really just says, well, you know, one of the variables is uh, is in here someplace, and we don't know what it is. Uh, so so it's interesting, uh, but it's not as informative as you would think it is. And then uh, there is also something I, I want to bring up with this. So you know, one of the interesting things is when you look at completed suicides, uh, people are much more likely to kill themselves if they actually plan it. So if if I'm it's not you know. On it's, it's, it doesn't look like that. But I think that suicide is a combination of both, planned and impulsive. That is, I'm feeling bad. I'm going to go ahead and write out my will. I'm going to go ahead and write a suicide note. But I'm not, I'm not necessarily going to commit suicide today at 6 o'clock. I've done all this planning, and then there's going to be some other variable, perhaps something that increases my impulsivity, something that pushes me over, that makes me commit suicide today at six o'clock. It's not that I planned to kill myself. So I think suicide, completed suicide, is both planned and impulsive. So as a psychiatrist, what do you tell potential patients or the loved ones of uh, potential suicide uh, victims? What do, you, what do you tell them? How do you, how do you spot that time when your loved one's going over the edge or you're going over the edge and ready to commit 
It, and, that and final act. Weather has nothing to do with it. Yeah. Uh, again, it's just, if, if you actually look at the numbers in terms of differences in barometric pressure, it's really quite low. Uh, so it's not really enough. It's just a statistical measure. Mm -hmm. No, so that's never part of... Uh, uh, no, the, it's not part the, of the equation, but what is? What, uh, what? In terms of identifying suicide, the biggest, the biggest issue is hopelessness. You know, it's not just low mood. Um, it's when you realize or come to the conclusion, it's re never really a, a true realization, but when you come to the conclusion that the present is bad and the future will be equally as bad and there's no hope that the future will be better than the present and you don't like the present, that's when you start thinking about suicide. If you are in a horrible present, but you think that the future might be better, that there is an end in sight for this, you generally don't commit suicide. So hope is perhaps the one, or hopelessness, depending on which side of the coin you're on, is the, the biggest driver of that. There are all sorts of other things. Um, I'm, you know, we're talking about right. impulsivity, and that's certainly an aspect. Uh, so there's several things that feed into that, but the number one thing you're looking for is hopelessness. Again, we're talking to Dr. Riff El Malik from the University of Louisville. He's a professor of psychiatry there. Um, let's move on to another topic that I wanted to talk about, ketamine. It was uh, a drug that is, I think folks called it the party drug. Uh, gives you hallucinations, folks, uh, you know, the hipsters at the parties would take ketamine to, to get off. But now it's being talked about as a, uh, a drug that you can be, be used to treat depression. Talk about that a little bit, how, how this came about. Yeah. Um, uh, so just some background. Ketamine is an anesthetic, and it's actually one of the first anesthetics uh, that was introduced for what's called conscious sedation. So you're, you're actually trying to do a procedure where the patient is maybe able to respond to some degree. Um, it's awkward to use because of uh, some of the issues with, like you said, hallucinations. Um, um, and uh, it, it transiently lost some favor in human use, but be, uh, remained very popular in animal use. Uh, party drugs, it's, um, I think the street name is Special K. Uh, and you're absolutely right, it's generally used as a hallucinogenic. Um, um, so... Um, it, um, so is it mainstream now? Are people using ketamine? Are doctors no. using ketamine to N treat their patients? No. With the 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 uh, the reason that ketamine became uh, a focus uh, in in the first place in psychiatry, um, we've sort of. Uh, um, used up our uh, brain chemicals. When, when we uh, treat patients, we generally use things like dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine. We try and manipulate those things, and we've got lots of medicines to do that, and we've sort of uh, exhausted that avenue. And, and, and now we're focusing on brain chemicals that we haven't generally worked very much with, and one of the major ones is a brain chemical called glutamate, which is very important excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. Glutamate is really, really hard to utilize. Uh, almost all drugs that affect glutamate cause tons of problems. Um, we study them in animals, but in humans they're really, really difficult, unpredictable, very problematic. And so we still want to use glutamate because we know that glutamate is associated with lots of psychiatric symptoms. The point then being, how do we actually manipulate that? And one of the old drugs, uh, ketamine, works on glutamate. We know it has a uh, safety issue, and that uh, was one of the reasons it was looked at in the first place. But it's not being used now. And, and it, if I go to my doctor, I shouldn't go and say, hey, I'm depressed, doc, uh, can you <laughs> prescribe me some ketamine? Uh, you can't say that. You cannot say that. There, it is being used okay. because there's actually really good data that shows that ketamine infusions can reduce horrible depressions, sometimes right. depressions that haven't responded to other things. But there's also uh, now very early data, and we're actually involved in a study that looks at this, showing that at least uh, S-ketamine, which is a specific enantiomer of ketamine, a specific form, form of ketamine, uh, may actually reduce or maybe even 
cure uh, a, a suicide ideation. Okay. Well, we, we've run out of time. We can talk about this in another day. Maybe when L gets done with the study on ketamine. That would that? be good. All right. Riff Malik, always good to talk to you.